All right, so next up we have Dimitri Cordon talking about functional block programming and debugging. So Dimitri is a postdoc at the University of Geneva, very interested in programming languages and compilers, and he's going to be showing us a programming environment called FunBlocks. Uh, thank you very much for an introduction. Uh, I, anyone can, uh, everyone can see my screen right? Looks good. Looks good. Excellent. Uh, so yeah, yeah um, thank you for having me. I will uh, talk to you about uh, our latest project, which is Funblux, uh, which is uh, an additional tool for, to, to teach programming. So before maybe a little bit of introduction, um, we were wondering uh, how we can teach programming. So uh, what I mean by programming, why my working definition of programming is that it's a set of activities that consists of uh, designing one uh, a program that has to run on, on, on one machine. And this includes many sub activities. It's not only the coding itself, but it is also uh, testing, understanding the specification, uh, simulating the program and, and so on. So this is really a kind of a process and uh, it's difficult to teach a process uh, other, other than just uh, ask people to, to do things, but at least maybe we can try to find the best way to start uh, this learning process. So how do we start it? Well, you can start with a real programming language. Uh, these days, Python and uh, JavaScript are very popular. So you can pick either of these languages, for instance, they are dynamic uh, and a lot of people will claim that they are simple. But my experience is that, in fact, it's really not, uh, especially if you work with uh, young students or even children. Uh, the problem is that what they are used to work with uh, is not as rigorous as a programming language. Uh, even if you, are, if you write mathematical formula on a piece of paper that are eventually meant to be written by a, a human, it's okay to make a slight syntactic mistakes here and there, whereas in a computer, you, you really need to be uh, extremely precise. Um, so one way to alleviate this problem is to rely on uh, what I would call user-friendly code editors. Uh, so Scratch is a very popular option uh, that is tilted toward uh, children and education of programming uh, at, um, at a, ver a very young age. And these kind of tools are always based on the same kind of ID. It's a, um, a, a visual programming language, block-based, and you just place blocks uh, on top of each other, and this represents the stacks of your program. The issue I take with this approach is that now you always have an imperative paradigm underneath. So that means your programs look something like that. It's a, a list of statements. Most of those are assignments into some kind of variable. And then you have uh, predefined functions that let you interact with the environment. Either you can print something or maybe uh, move a, a character in a virtual environment if it's uh, like a kind of game and you need to code this game. But this begs the question, what uh, is this program actually doing? And if you are learning programming, this, is, this might not be obvious. And if you ask students uh, what this program is doing, you will get most likely two kind of answers. Uh, and actually both are completely correct. So I guess most of you uh, guess the, the first one, uh, that's E0, congratulations, you are thinking like a Python uh, programmer. Uh, obviously, we assign uh, 0 to y, we assign the value of y to x, then uh, we modify y, but it doesn't change x. So when we print x, we get the value we got at line 2. But uh, we've been uh, uh, looking at spreadsheet before. So if you have the semantics of a spreadsheet in mind, then 7 is a correct answer, because x equals y is just a reference to the value of the reference uh, uh, of the cell y. And then if you change the value of the inside the reference in an Excel spreadsheet, for instance, this makes sense that x will, uh, will change. So now we see that there is already kind of misunderstanding about the semantics. So it, even if it looks very simple, this is only four lines of very, very uh, basic code, it can still lead to confusions uh, with, uh, with young children. And even if you say, well, uh, let's forget about that. This is really just uh, forget about spreadsheet and stuff like that. We, it's programming, we know what the assignment operator is. Well, I can raise you with uh, uh, other kind of tricky situations. Uh, here you have a program that where you allocate an object and then you change a field of this object and say you have two variables and you make aliases between these variables. So now what is the output of this program? If you, once again, both uh, answers are correct. If you say, 
uh, that it should be a cursor two, congratulations, you are still thinking like a Python developer. But if you think it should be one and two, then yeah, you're right. This is uh, the value semantics you would find in languages like Swift or C, C++, and things like that. So uh, here, it's, a, it's really a semantic issue. It's not only a syntax issue. So that means even if you have a very nice environment, so this is a, a kind of a scratch code that you would get, that completely forgets uh, the, the, the semantics difficulty. So now you cannot make semantic error, it just plays blocks. And uh, the, this program has to be uh, syntactic, syntactically correct, excuse me. The semantics is still the same problem. You, we have all the assignment issues that we've just mentioned. And we also have to learn a bunch of other control uh, structures, such as loops and conditional statements. Uh, whose semantics is not clearly defined uh, within the language itself. Uh, I just need to know, I need to, to learn what a loop means. And this can feel really overwhelming. So our approach was to uh, start from the basics uh, with two very, very simple questions. First, what is data and uh, what is computation? So very simply, data is anything that you can declare. Uh, in, with a declarative approach, anything that you can state uh, uh, being that is a data. A blue square is a data. So what is a computation? It's a transformation of the data. For instance, turn a blue square into a big simple is a transformation. So now I have a very, very uh, super high abstraction. I don't need to care about the implementation specifics. I just want to express that I, there is a mean to translate this blue uh, square into a pink circle. And now I have a tool that I can reuse to explain other kind of transformation. I can turn a blue square into a, a pink circle. I can turn a pink circle into a green triangle. And I naturally have a way to compose this different, different transformation. In fact, I have a, trans, uh, uh, a transition system if I want to speak in technical terms, but I don't even need to uh, know that. I just have a bunch of rules and I can apply these rules to reach a specific goal. I can also have uh, the same framework used to create uh, even stronger abstraction. Let's have two rules that really look like each other. I want to turn a blue square to a pink square or a blue star into a pink star. Well, in fact, I just need a rule that transforms a shape into uh, a blue shape into a pink shape. So now I've created uh, another layer of abstraction very easily, very intuitively. And this is in fact polymorphism. But if you go to uh, uh, educators, computer science educators and say, well, we will do uh, polymorphic functions with uh, young children of 12 years old, they, they just think you are crazy. But in fact, this is what you can do with this kind of approach. So how does it translate uh, in all two? So we also have a block-based uh, kind of approach. So this is uh, the, 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 the visual syntax we have for language, uh, for fun blocks. So it's basically terms. This is the basic currency of everything in fun blocks. Everything is a term. So um, it's basically a functor and a bunch of subterms that represent the, uh, the, the arguments of this functor. You could think of this as a function uh, and the arguments of this function. But maybe this function doesn't have uh, explicit semantics. It doesn't have to be uh, in the, have to have a, a semantics. It's just here a statement of something to data. And then you can have transformations of these different terms. For instance, here I have this ask uh, transformation, uh, and this is a rewriting rule that transforms the statement into a question. Uh, everything works by pattern matching, so I just need to. A check on the left side or here the top part of the rule if it matches the, the, the term I have and if it does then I, I can just rewrite it uh, and this is the only uh, operational semantics I have uh, to know in the entire framework. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, using this I can even explain the other uh, kind of control structure that I've mentioned before that uh, with an imperative approach I need to already know. So for instance, here, I can define what it means uh, to execute a conditional statement. Notice that the, the then and else here are written with squares uh, rather than rounded uh, uh, rectangles. This is because they represent variables. So here, these uh, two different rewriting rules describe uh, the both branches, uh, both possible outcome of uh, uh, conditional expression. And you would match the then and the else block with whatever terms you have, and then you could instantiate this rule, this particular rule for any kind of, uh, of term. So maybe uh, I, I'll get to a quick demo. Uh, I, 
a lot of viewers were very eager to, to have a demo of the tool to see how it goes. So here, uh, here it is. Um, it's uh, still early stage of development, so the interface is not so sexy at the moment. But basically, it's a, an editor that lets you uh, uh, drag and drop the elements that you have on the left. It's kind of a toolbox. And then you can uh, create your, your terms uh, here just by uh, placing things uh, and drag and drop things. Uh, so for instance, here, this would be the description of a list uh, that contains the number one, for instance. And now we could, uh, we could write a rule that we write uh, something that is uh, a list of something. So let's say here, uh, instead of this, I will place a variable. So a list of anything is written uh, to this uh, particular thing. And now I can, sorry. And now I can go, I can hop into the debugger and I can try to apply my different rules on the program states and it will uh, evaluate my program. And, uh, uh, and I can uh, go back to the states. But I, I, think, I think I'll show that with a, a more involved example. And there's one other addition uh, that we think was uh, very interesting in our tool uh, that we found in, in other similar approaches was to have uh, a hybrid uh, the, uh, version of, of both the visual syntax and the, a textual syntax. So we can hop into the textual syntax here and uh, we can write directly a program in the textual form. And all the changes I do here have a direct impact uh, in uh, the, the, the visual person as well. So I can... Uh, no, I made a mistake. So I could, uh, for instance, write here as a second rule. Uh, it, it's actually the same, but I, I can see that I can edit my program in both versions. So if I write something a, a little more involved here, this is the concatenation of a list. And I, I go here, I can see uh, how it goes. Um, obviously, because we chose to have uh, the states uh, uh, develop uh, horizontally. There is a, a clear problem of the interface, but we can uh, double click on something to make it smaller. And, and so this is how you can manage uh, larger states. And now in the debugger, you can uh, try to play with this and see how you can uh, reduce your term using the correct rule. If you don't use the correct rule, then the, the, there is like this visual indication that you made a mistake. And, and basically that's it. So the, the things we are working now is to try to define a type system for this. Uh, it is really obviously a bit difficult because type systems are something uh, a little more difficult to approach with uh, children or very young students. Uh, but we are trying to find ways to make it a little hidden and maybe uh, take insight from gradual typing so that it doesn't have to be uh, something that you need to define it. It, it could be something just additionally in, included in the tool that uh, some educator could use as they see fit. And uh, that's all I've got. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you, Dimitri. So does anyone, uh, anyone have any questions for Dimitri? Raise your hand or pop it in the chat. I have a first question. Can you do capture avoiding substitution? Um, it depends on, on the way you, you applied roots. So uh, yes, you can, but uh, you need to be, to, to be careful about uh, how you want to, to apply uh, the different roots. You want to do. The, the automatic strategy, I, I didn't have time to show it, but the automatic strategy just runs everything and then you could have, uh, you could capture uh, uh, something. All right, Raleigh has a question. Uh, yeah, hi. So, um, I'm going to use it. Um, yeah, so you, at the beginning, you described, you, you kind of asked two questions. You said, what is data and, and what's our, what is code? And you, you said the data is a thing and, and kind of a computation is a transformation of a thing. But I guess one way of characterizing functional programming would be to say that transformations are also data. So, so I was wondering whether that's also on your kind of agenda. Are you thinking about higher order data? Mm -hmm. uh, it, I think it would be cool to have a higher order um, transformation rules into the system. 
but uh, we thought that it added a, a lot of complexity to something that was already powerful enough to be an explanatory device. Uh, the thing is that we don't plan on phone blocks being a, an actual tool to do actual programming. Uh, and we don't plan on phone blocks to be something to explain really um, uh, complex stuff about uh, functional programming in general or typing system in general. It, it should really be something, our vision is that it is something uh, as an introduction. And once you get into it, uh, and maybe you, you try to work with the, with, with the, the textual language, you, you get comfortable with the textual language, it's time to move on to something more involved and, and maybe it's time to move on to Haskell or another a cool uh, functional language that uh, uh, lets you explore all these uh, complex questions more in depth. As a kind of transition to a textual language rather than a, a programming yeah, language. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I definitely appreciated that it was bimodal. Uh, Simon has a question. Hi, just wanted to say really, really love the talk and love the slides and love the demo. Yeah, um, sure. I was just Wondering about the the kind of type system aspect of it. So, I guess in Scratch, you've got you know the, these repeat blocks where you can just only plug something in. I mean, you can't plug wrong things into wrong things. So, I mean, is there any way that you could kind of marry that mode of interaction with a type system? So you can't say add uh, booleans and floats. Yeah, th this is exactly what we want to do, actually. Um, the, the thing that we uh, are trying to achieve is to have this gradual ID. So at first, you have completely dy dynamic taps, and you could put anything uh, in, uh, in any space. But once you add your uh, types, there is kind of a reward in the sense that now you cannot put an int where a string is expected or a list is expected. And uh, this would um, uh, support the idea that, well, if you type your program, then you will catch more errors. And we have this, uh, this feature that we are working on uh, right now, which is um, a tool that we um, uh, analysis that will catch yeah, whether your rewriting rules are defined for all cases of the types uh, uh, that you that you gave, because you can give like. Um, a recursive definition of a list, and then you have the scones and empty that I quickly showed before. Uh, and then you could use this analysis to check that all your rules are defined for all possible cases, and so that you cannot uh, end up in an unresolved state. Uh, oh, I see. So this kind of analysis could be used to help uh, the, the, the students understand the, 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 the consequences of the rules of write and, uh, and the full type correctness that you can get from a type system. So I, I guess later on, it could be, you know, if you add in um, kind of algebraic data type things, some types, and you could actually look at totality of type checking and things like yeah. that. That'd be really cool. Really cool. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you for the question. And then I last short question from Raleigh. Yeah, I just had a very quick follow up to Simon's question, which is a really, really nice question. Um, yeah, I guess if you could define a kind of recursive data type like list, you could almost imagine designing that as a visual shape, like a sort of stencil that you can only compose in certain ways. You know, you can compose it in a kind of iterative way, but uh, you can't compose it in a kind of typing compatible way. So, yeah, I think that's a great question that Simon asked, not mine. Yeah. All right, let's thank Dimitri again. <laughs>